Has there ever been a special interest that you've held dear, that upon discovering it for the first time, set off all kinds of pleasure-inducing chemicals that trigger new and exciting bodily reactions? Whether it be watching Star Wars for the very first time, the dopamine rush of collecting Pokemon cards, discovering pornography, Oh, you're so big. Oh, yeah. Or the subject of this video, a stealth video game. However your consumerist based interests developed, eventually your fixation for whatever it was grew to a point where you had no problem sliding your mouth underneath that fading drip every once in a while, satisfying your thirst just enough to rekindle the expectations that grew from that initial experience. Only for the next iteration of whatever it is you've been waiting for, to change out the sweet, sweet nectarous flavor of your expectations with unwanted bodily fluids. What do I do with this? Well, don't feel so alone now, because just about everybody across every type of medium eventually gets the taste of feces put into whatever it was they had a strict expectation for. Whether it be due to following market trends, a conniving writer, or just poor business models. No matter what it is or how many years it takes, eventually the ingredients change and that sweet glittery nectar you've been drinking turns brown for you. But something I've learned over my 23 years of living is that the potency of crap often isn't noticeable if you don't set your expectations so high, or if you have no expectations whatsoever. If you go into something like that, you can basically forgive all the noble risk taking necessary to evolve a property that results in your latte being browner than you usually take it if you had those expectations going in. Evident by my relationship with a game that is a black sheep within its highly regarded franchise, Splinter Cell Conviction. A game that I don't necessarily think anyone would consider to be terrible. Although most retrospectives tend to give it quite a hard time for its rather bold innovation of a franchise whose mechanics were already beloved. For me, it was my entry point for the series and the genre of stealth altogether. And because of that, I was fascinated the first time I played it as a 13 year old. Fascinated to the point where I was spending chunks out of the day replaying the demo from the Xbox Live Marketplace, experimenting with different forms of tactics on each run. Whether it was pure stealth, speed running, pistol only, takedowns only, body shields only, throwing body shields only, the various possibilities brimming in each of Sam Fisher's hunting grounds stood out more than any other game in my limited 360 library at the time. And to an unseasoned gamer who hadn't really given the genre of stealth a fair shot outside of a couple of James Bond shooters and punching the back of Grunt's heads on Assault on the Control Room, it was instantly captivating. And while I admit that playing it today doesn't cause my hair to stand up straight like I'm making it sound like it did when I was 13, I still highly regard Conviction as one of the greater stealth games I've ever played. Well, stealth action game I've ever played. And this is coming from someone who is a devoted Kojima cuck. This is due to how I feel it's able to immediately sell you on its gameplay formula. Conviction made me instantly grasp the appeal of a stealth game within the first couple minutes of playing it. Sam controlled with ease, staying unseen was as easy as sticking to the shadows, and executing takedowns was lightning quick. I felt I was able to perform feats that were unneedly complicated as well as daunting to pull off in other games with stealth components. Its predator-like feel and smooth controls ended up clicking immediately for me and it compelled me to eventually shoplift it from Superstore one day after school when I was 14 along with a copy of 2010's Alien vs Predators. Worth it? Mm, probably not. Conviction has a perplexing stigma in the eyes of hardcore fans, with many often citing it as the series false dawn. And not to get into the weeds of why Splinter Cell no longer suits Ubisoft's business model, I'd say that assessment is pretty fair considering what has come from the franchise since. This fucking beard is weird. However, despite its disregard of subtlety in favor of near consequenceless stealth, this reinvention was required to keep the series profitable. 
And well, I'd say that reinvention was a success. Conviction being my entry point to the series and genre gave me the freedom to overlook the very liberal changes it made in terms of its pacing and overall direction from prior games. And by being able to do that, I was left with a very positive impression of what the appeal behind a stealth game actually was. Although I don't have very much hands-on experience with Splinter Cell outside of this game, I still think I'm able to say it handled its bold transition commendably while still retaining its franchise's dignity. This was a new Sam Fisher in more than one sense. Past fans had to make peace with the rudimentary redesign of their franchise, and those new to it at the time more than likely had gaming experiences that allowed them to relate to the newfound emphasis on action. You either loved, tolerated, or despised this new gray-haired Sam. Conviction's action and stealth blend made to offset the patience required for those lengthier, slower burning infiltrations of past titles should honestly be more credited for selling the prospect of playing as a silent, murderous spy to an audience far larger than tiptoeing through the dark with eyes fixated on light and sound meters ever did, even if it came at the cost of replacing those things with an abundance of quick time takedowns and headshots. Despite lacking the tactical depth the franchise was known for, even after 10 years, Conviction still holds up on all the promises that its developers made that came at the cost of shedding those intimidating mechanics. Just about anyone is able to grasp the enjoyment of playing as the silent force of nature that Sam Fisher is. You still feel a sense of vulnerability since enemies can quickly put you down, but your agileness makes outwitting them to be only an intermediate ordeal, whether it be one or four of them at a time. If there's one thing Conviction excels at satisfying, it's stranding you into this feeling of being a fast, methodical killer, no matter how seasoned of a player you are. So the burning question is, how well is this demonstrated in the actual stealth component of the gameplay? I'd say brilliantly. I attribute a large part of why Conviction's faster pace works so well is to its use of a point and press cover system, its environments being densely packed with opportunities to maneuver and flank, and its ultra simplified detection system. All of these things combined accomplish eliminating a lot of the uncertainty I'm typically faced with in more contemporary stealth games. This guy's coming. What? Things like whether or not the lighting conditions or dimensions of a piece of cover will be enough to prevent me from being detected and if I'll have enough time to move to the next piece of cover. This results in a lot of liberation in terms of movement, encouraging a bold playstyle. All thanks to some very simple additions to Conviction's stealth formula. For example, instead of having to consider the degree of visibility your character has, the game makes it as simple as you're either invisible by means of darkness or cover, or you're not. There's virtually no in-between. When it comes to lighting, the distinction between player visibility is made clear with a simple black and white filter. The important thing this aids in is making pathing a lot easier as the player is guaranteed 100% concealment when they are in darkness, provided they aren't running or making noise. There's no reason to second guess yourself for standing in the open as long as you're in the shadows. This paired with the ability to take out lights means environments are never in short supply of potential avenues, as well as providing the player small opportunities for experimentation to aid in advancement. Conviction's levels are crafted to be full of these kinds of possibilities and they aren't just limited to the lighting. Environments are packed with cover that your character can latch onto, vault over, and slide between with the use of a cover system. Taking advantage of this is deemed essential and emphasized by the binding for cover being bound to right click on PC and left trigger on the 360 by default. So thank god that using it isn't a pain in the ass. Actually, it's remarkably smooth and easy to utilize. Transitioning between cover works like a charm thanks to visual indications that prompt where you'll end up when you center your screen around a piece of cover. What I love about these bounding animations is how they briefly increase your character speed while not adding to your sound profile, giving you more of a reason to use the cover system where you can as opposed to just crouch walking. This also makes bounding to cover feel less like taking a gamble than trusting in your own dexterity to move your character manually, and also acting as a tool for closing in on enemies for takedowns. Although functionally, nothing is very revolutionary about this cover system, as it basically is the same one found in so many cover-based shooters from the time, I'd say it's one of Conviction's biggest assets. Because not only does it completely recontextualize what is typically used for a shooter, but it feels far more engaging to use with stealth mechanics poured on top. Moving between the sightlines of multiple enemies is an adrenaline rush stealth games have been floundering since their inception, and with the additional mobility this cover system adds, that's a prospect more players are able to enjoy without an intermediate understanding of the limit of their character's movement. 
In fact, it's the very first thing you're shown how to do in the tutorial. Its simplicity is truly why it's brilliant. Areas that are ripe with cover opportunities essentially play like a three-dimensional version of Frogger, but with slow-moving guards and cones of vision in place of the high-speed vehicles. Regressing from a position that remaining in will lead to your detection is easier than it would be without it, and situations like having to slip between the sight lines of two guards about to sandwich you feels far less daring and simply becomes a matter of timing your movement. And thankfully, when you have been spotted and worse comes to worse, this cover system becomes a useful means of making hasty retreats turn into smooth counterattacks within moments, provided you haven't wandered into an area without cover. Even with this agility your character is blessed with, it's not like becoming detected doesn't come without consequence. This still is a stealth game after all. However, you can start to see how the parallels between action and stealth become even less subtle as your ability to kill gives room for that bolder, albeit more difficult, playstyle to shine, putting the genius of Conviction's balancing act on full display. Even when combat is fired on all cylinders, you're given far more advantages by becoming unseen due to things like quick death times, your inability to take accurate follow-up shots with firearms, slow recharging health, and the difficulty of taking on more than one enemy at a time, unless of course using mark and execute. When encounters do go loud, they don't last very long unless you quickly evade. The distinction Conviction's gameplay makes here is how evasion isn't poised towards complete enemy avoidance in the instances that you are detected. Rather, it's more momentary avoidance as you're given plenty of means to strike back at a group of enemies that you've alerted, whether by means of acrobatic takedowns or blissfully using the mark and execute feature to counterattack at large. The mobility system, the visual representation of your last known location, and the AI having tunnel vision towards it give you even more flexibility in this regard. All these systems and mechanics accommodate guerrilla tactics better than most games that make stealth a supplementary playstyle next to all-out action. I'd even go as far to say it could be more enjoyable to play like this as a result of the momentum these situations result in you having. There's a real rush in weaving through an environment packed with enemies, chaining together kills by suddenly emerging to get the drop on one, only to vanish and do it again from another angle. By always encouraging you to constantly be making advancements in form of flanking and brief uses of brute force, you're not given much downtime. And this is probably the underlining reason behind why I enjoy Conviction so much. Situationally, you may need to change speeds or even press the brakes a little, but there are plenty of tricks up your sleeve you can easily access if you've gone too far and walked into a bad situation. Gadgets like the portable EMP and EMP grenades temporarily stun enemies in your general area, making situations like running into the crosshairs of a group of enemies without any cover nearby salvageable. It is sort of cheap, but it's just another tool that Conviction gives you to stay mobile and away from the restart screen, minimizing the situations where you need to find a hiding spot until the situation goes back to normal. Sure, it does eventually end up making the game feel less rewarding, but at the same time, it guarantees almost no dull moments that test your patience. Look what we have here. Speaking of patience testing, it's important to bring up a couple of things that Conviction purposely got rid of in favor of the hardball lethal stealth approach it's known for. Ubisoft Montreal were very intentful on subtracting a lot of aspects of past Splinter Cell's more caution-oriented gameplay. Gameplay that necessitated you take into account things like the time it takes for enemies to regain consciousness and the placement of the bodies that you leave behind. Conviction, on the other hand, removes the option for non-lethal takedowns altogether and gives close to zero consequences for leaving behind suspicious evidence. What is significant about this is that despite these things being absent, baiting tactics that arise from stealth mechanics like these play a much more seamless role into Conviction's gameplay thanks to these aspects being excluded. This dissimilarity between Conviction and prior Splinter Cells is something this game is often prodded for, but at the same time it's responsible for making these ambush tactics, which by the way are often very hard to execute and reproduce to this degree in other games, just the opposite. Since Conviction's quick fluidity isn't chastised by the consequences for making your presence known, enemy encounters often can give way for small breaths of creativity and improvisation without the preparation or precision they would require otherwise. And although it shortchanges the depth that having those stealth aspects come with, this limited freedom is consistently apparent in Conviction's encounters. Whether using the environment to evade a group of enemies that you've alerted, to using it to track down enemies individually, or stunning groups to give you time to mark and execute them, 
These are all tactics that are inviting to utilize since they hardly require many inputs or reflexes, just some intermediate skill. And despite this, it still feels satisfying as hell to pull these things off. It never feels like you're playing the game wrong when you get caught and your hand is forced to use one of these tactics. And I believe this to be the integral reason behind why Conviction forgoes non-lethal playstyles altogether. Accommodating a non-lethal playstyle contradicts some of the reason it omits aspects of prior games in the first place, and that is that it simply draws away from Conviction's biggest strengths that lie in your character's momentum. Sure, having it as an option would be nice, but I don't really believe it adds anything other than more things to strive for from a completionist standpoint, especially considering how Blacklist handled its inclusion. The option for a humanitarian approach to enemy encounters only ever enhances tension in gameplay by offering an advantage to the player for doing things a harder way or disadvantaging them for doing things an easier way. But generally, these repercussions hardly have an immediate gameplay drawback, and the only ones I can think of are kind of tacked on for more meta reasons. You enjoy all the killing, that's why. <laughs> Not to mention it necessitates that AI can regain consciousness and that the AI you haven't dealt with yet can interact with them in some form. And to put it plainly, it'd be hard for any repercussions you'd endure resulting from the AI finding evidence you've left behind to play a role in encounters that would blend well with the abilities that allow you to clear through areas as swiftly as they do. Having to worry about leaving behind traces that could be discovered would result in an anxiety-ridden cleanup session after clearing every area, and that just wouldn't jive whatsoever with Conviction's rapid pace. Sure, I can see how removing it makes the game seem jarring if the other changes weren't already, but for anyone to call Conviction inherently bad for this reason is overlooking why its exclusion makes the combat feel as tight as it does. I can- What the hell can I- The only real standout problem in the formula is how the mark and execute feature is way too liberal, especially in the campaign with weapons that have the ability to tag more than two targets at a time. They turn otherwise challenging arenas into fish in the bucket scenarios. In the past when I've played Conviction, I used to default towards the 5.7, a pistol that is described by Victor Cost as Sam's favorite. Look in the bag to find your favorite pistol. I didn't get you anything. And it's easy to see why, as it has the ability to take up to four enemies at a time. Using it made me impulse towards taking as many enemies as I could before luring them into my line of sight so I could execute them. And I found that this got rid of a lot of tension and stealth, as well as variety in combat. So about halfway through my latest playthrough, I opted out for the very first pistol you get in the game. The Mark 43, which only has two tags, and using the M468, which has three tags maximum. Which, by the way, I was only fine with using because the primary weapons in this game have a whole suite of drawbacks that wound up making their role very situational. Anyway, I found I preferred this loadout tenfold as it made it a lot harder to turn arenas into turkey shoots, since I had to use my smaller amount of tags more thoughtfully. Due to this, I was constantly being challenged to find more ways to get closer to enemies, and this ended up becoming a happy middle ground that brought out the best aspects of conviction stealth and gratifying action as limiting my usage of mark and execute gave more room for the mobility system that was built for guerrilla tactics in the first place to take more center stage, ultimately making for a more engaging experience than resorting to a kill button all the time. In a much smaller moderation than the game should allow you, mark and execute does add a very satisfying dynamic to enemy encounters, specifically by giving you a method to briefly expose yourself and escape back into the shadows unscathed. Like in that situation I described earlier, where you're seconds away from being blown to bits by a small group of enemies. It's just that a more unhinged usage of it ends up detracting from the experience. Especially in the campaign, where environments pack only about half a dozen enemies on average, so using any more than two executions at a time feels incredibly cheap. However, in Deniable Ops and the Cooperative Campaign, thankfully it's a different story. I found the over-reliance on mark and execute to be mostly rectified due to higher enemy counts and arenas with more obstructions that separate groups of them. This difference in level design offers more open-endedness in hunting grounds in order to accommodate a second player, and I noticed that it made mark and execute less of a go-to tactic. 
there is still plenty of opportunities to use it individually, but the differences really come down to it not feeling like you're killing half the challenge by using it. And although a second player can string together their tags with yours, doubling the potential amount of maximum tags to 8, moments where you can decimate an entire arena with this function seem few and far between since they require a lot of extra coordination, which makes them really satisfying when you are capable of pulling them off, by the way. And this is all opposed to the stark contrast of the campaign, where mark and execute can be used at such a high frequency so effortlessly, it makes John Wick's shooting spree seem pretty tame in comparison. If you're willing to dial back the use of it on your own, especially in the single player, mark and execute doesn't become as much of a hindrance to Conviction's gameplay, but it's ultimately in the player's hands how restrictive they want to be with it. The thing you have to understand is this. The Sam Fisher you knew is dead. Conviction is a bloody tale with revenge as the main theme, and there's a lot that is done to emphasize this. From the use of red that spills onto every aspect of the design, to the brutal interrogation sequences, and Sam forgoing the use of non-lethal methods altogether, it's evident that there was a major effort to make this story distinct from other Splinter Cells. And thanks to this effort, I found it wasn't very hard to be bought into the story Conviction tried to tell when I played it all those years ago. What stuck out about it to me was how Sam was put into the very personal position akin to other on-screen badasses who have their one humanizing factor taken away from them. Due to this, Conviction already has far more relatable stakes than your typical espionage setup. I recall it leaving a notable impression on me for this gravitas and dark tone, especially how it affected the portrayal of its main character, a disgruntled old badass that had run all out of patience. This still is a satisfying setup, and I remember really caring about how it was going to play out. But after playing it again, I realize it's not nearly as great as I remembered it. The story of Sam Fisher coming out of hiding to seek out the truth behind his daughter's murder, only to be strung into a conspiracy involving a mole inside Third Echelon that is attempting to overthrow the president, has a couple standout moments to its credit. They at least make it worth the playthrough. But overall, the story isn't strung together terribly well. It winds up feeling cliched as a result of how plot points are gone through very abruptly. When this happens in a game, I rack up a lot of the reason behind why it typically comes from how much the game actually focuses on its storytelling. Splinter Cell Conviction, despite so many aspects of its gameplay and aesthetic being geared towards this theme of revenge, doesn't do nearly enough storytelling to make it stick. The single player campaign is pretty short, with only 11 missions that run an average of about 15 to 30 minutes. Not only are the levels themselves short, but the cutscenes that play out in between them are very brief and avoid any responsibility they might have had to flesh things out. The consequence of this is a narrative that feels very ham-fisted and fails to pay off things you'd think would be series-defining moments, like Sam being reunited with his daughter after believing she was dead for five years and the game's conclusion taking place in the White House out of all places. The former resolving a major plot point that was sewn into the story since the prior game that falls short of being very impactful. Kind of a wasted opportunity if you ask me. The whole mole thing and Third Echelon suddenly becoming a force of evil is a bit too difficult to grasp. Despite this being the only Splinter Cell game I've beaten, I know that Third Echelon suddenly transforming into this evil, rogue military is very implausible and is kind of going overboard at giving Sam a reason to go after the antagonist, who is not very surprisingly behind both this and the attempted murder on his daughter. Still don't get it, do you? Sarah didn't matter. Threatening her was just a way to get to you. And leveraging you was a way to get to Third Echelon. And Third Echelon? That was a way to get what they wanted out of the White House. Yeah. But it's not all terrible. Although I could see why the shortcomings could make you despise the way Conviction fumbles such a close to home story, especially if you were fond of the storylines from past games, at least it goes all out in terms of how it presents it, and it definitely pays off in a few instances. Like in one very powerful scene that was enough to give me a good old case of the Gooseys, where Sam discovers the truth about the cover up of his daughter's death that is followed by a massacre you get to act out in gameplay. Conviction has a lot of surprisingly well acted scenes like this that are full of dialogue that lands right on the money. Like earlier in the same level, where Sam begins an assault on the third echelon headquarters. But if you'd like to make an appointment, Mr. Fisher, I used to work here. Security alert. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if Sam does this at every place he used to work. One tall soy latte, that'll be $2.95. And sir, can I have your name for your order? Fisher, I used to work here. 
I'm particularly fond of the scene where Sam is being reintroduced to Grimm's daughter after getting captured at the start of the game. In no more than a couple minutes, it gave me a near perfect insight into these two's history with one another and made me honestly care about their complicated relationship. You understand me? I will kill you! Seriously, all the performances in the main cast are top notch both in terms of motion capture and voiceover. I thought Claudia Bezzo and Howard Siegel, the voice actors for Anna Grin's daughter and Victor Cost, stood out just as much as Michael Ironside. Even the sentries that populate each arena deserve some praise as well. They're boastfully arrogant and nervously taunt you as you kill their comrades one by one. They do tend to overdo it at times, but if it weren't for their inability to keep their mouths closed, it wouldn't make savagely killing them as satisfying as it is, especially when they start name dropping Sarah. Andre Colbert. Were you saying something about my daughter? And of course, any chance Michael Ironside gets to read off a line, it demands you to listen. Especially when he's playing off characters that wound up trapped in a room with him. I'm bulletproof. Goddamn bulletproof, you hear? Oh, really? Oh, oh, you shot me! Oh! You know, you need to work on that whole Son bullet perfect. I'm not especially read up on his relationship with the series, but hearing him talk about the character of Sam Fisher in the development of prior games, it seems this was really the story he was looking forward to in acting. And I'd say him staying in the saddle this long proved to be rewarding. He does a phenomenal job at prevailing a decisive, yet vicious man who's determined to get his vengeance. And luckily, he still has a sense of humor about some things. But he owns the spotlight, and replaying this game has given me a newfound appreciation for his acting ability. Last question. This is the important one. What do you know about my daughter? There are other aspects about Conviction that do a lot more than most games do to suck you into its story and intertwine it with its gameplay. Aspects that I think people criticize it a bit too harshly for. For instance, the interrogation sequences, although not immensely interactive, especially if you've played through them before, I found to be very satisfying more so than watching Sam beat the crap out of someone in a cutscene. They do a good job of putting you in his shoes and letting you release some anger alongside him. And although it doesn't get paid off, this small flashback scene at the beginning of the game where Sam kills some burglars was a really cool way to reintroduce you to his relationship with his daughter and give a tutorial to the mark and execute feature at the same time. The environmental text and videos that display onto surfaces in real time do a lot to reinforce the tone of the game by stylizing the emotion, sometimes even literally. They are a great way from a gameplay perspective to build suspense and to foreshadow things to come. It also ends up making Conviction's muted color palette look surprisingly sleek. Seriously, I wish more games did stuff like this. And although some points of the plot don't get the blood pumping like they should, Michael Nilsson and Kevin Cohen's soundtrack give the entire experience a huge antidote of emotion. With riveting and sometimes even psychotic themes that drum up the action-packed set pieces, as well as subtle rhythms that make the stealth that precedes them all the more suspenseful. to mention a beautiful main theme that encapsulates all the sacrifice, apprehension, and bloodshed that the story strives for, and that has a place as one of my favorite themes in gaming. may not be as mechanically deep or favoring in terms of stealth as some would have liked, but the ways it ended up doubling down on its blend of aggressive mechanics with bare-bones stealth fundamentals has a lot that can be appreciated, even if some parts of the formula are noticeably unhinged. While its story may be a rehashing of certain spy-slash-action thrillers, it's all held up by some very unique storytelling techniques that enriches both the visual narrative as well as how you experience it during gameplay. It's a departure of many things already established, and I can absolutely grasp why it might have been a slap in the face if you are already a fan. But unlike many reboots, Conviction embraces its bold new direction without being noticeably weighed down by a urge to cater to expectations. And thanks to that, as well as time well spent going back to the drawing board, 
Its combat and movement abilities fit the mission layouts like a glove in all but one instance. And the ankle deep skill requirement necessary to master these abilities makes it easy for anyone to enjoy the constant stream of enemy encounters thrown at you through its various modes. I do wish it packed more in terms of both narrative and overall content, but it's a strong foundation that anybody can learn to love. And I hope that when Splinter Cell returns, if it ever does, that it doesn't forget about this rogue and violent chapter in its history.